you and the people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt, to the land of which I swore to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, saying, to your descendants I will give it. And I will send my angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanite and the Amorite and the Hittite and the Prezite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in your midst, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. And when the people heard this bad news, they mourned, and no one put on their ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, Say to the children of Israel, You are a stiff-necked people. I could come up into your midst in one moment and consume you. Now, therefore, take off your ornaments that I may know what to do to you. So the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by Mount Hor. Moses took his tent and pitched it outside the camp, far from the camp, and called to the tabernacle of meeting. And it came to pass that everyone who sought the Lord went out to the tabernacle of meeting, which was outside the camp. So it was, whenever Moses went out to the tabernacle, that all the people rose, and each man stood at the tent door and watched Moses until he had gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass, when Moses entered the tabernacle, that the pillar of cloud descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle, and the Lord talked with Moses. And the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the tabernacle door, and all the people rose and worshipped, each man in his tent door. So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face, as a man speaks to his friend, and he would return to the camp. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. Then Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people. But you have not let me know whom you shall send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found grace in my sight. Now, therefore, I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way, that I may know you and that I may find grace in your sight. And consider that this nation is your people. And he said, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Then he said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. For how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight? except you go with us. So we shall be separate, your people and I, from all the people who are upon the face of the earth. So the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. And he said, please, show me your glory. Then he said, I will make all the goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. And the Lord said, here is a place by me, and you shall stand on the rock. So it shall be, while my glory passes by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and will cover you with my hand while I pass by, and then... I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Oh God, we praise you and we glorify you. We exalt you. We pray for your presence. We pray for you to be here today. Fill this place with your glory. We pray this in your name. Amen. If you would please be seated. This past week, we as a church, you as a family, we as a whole, you as an individual began reading the book, The 40-Day Devotional, Why I Pray by John DeVries. This past week, hopefully, you began with day one and read all the way. We'll finish day seven today. Next week is week two, beginning tomorrow on Monday. I hope you start reading day eight and read all the way through day through 14. Encourage us all to stay together and read it each night as a family and as an individual. But as we began this week, the author John DeVries had one main question. That question was this, why do we pray? What's its purpose? Really, why do we do it? And I do believe if I paired you up today and made you get a buddy and say, tell the person beside you why we pray, why we should do it, I believe that everyone here would be able to give a great churchy answer, something that you've learned since vacation Bible school. I believe you'd get the right answers. So let me phrase it a different way. Let me ask you, 
What was the last thing you prayed for? What'd you pray for this morning? What'd you pray for last night? What did you pray for this week? What was the one thing that consumed you that you brought before prayer to God? What was that one thing this week? Did you pray for help at home or, or help at work? Did you pray about your health? Did you, did you pray about your finances? Did, did you pray about a relationship that uh, things are going on within your life or someone else's life? What did you pray for? And I want to tell you that whatever you prayed for, you did the right thing. The Bible tells us that we are to take these petitions to God. So taking to him, that's the right thing. But let me ask this question. What happens if your prayer doesn't get answered? What happens if it doesn't get answered the way that you want it to get answered? Is there another reason for prayer? Is there something else that's supposed to come out of it? And that's the question the author, John DeVries, asked this week. Is there another purpose in prayer instead of getting our needs met? And this is how he answered the question. DeVries wrote in our devotional, do you talk to your spouse because it pays or because you love? You see, if you talk to someone only because it pays, you're doing it for a selfish reason. When we view prayer in terms of the number of answers we get, and when we track our answers in prayer journals, just to be sure our time is well spent, are we not wrecking our relationship with God? This is why we must never prostitute prayer, degrading it in our perception of God into some mechanical program for getting our way. Rather, prayer must be as living and natural and exciting and sharing our hearts with a friend. See, what DeVries talked about this week is that prayer is not about us getting our wants and our desires. That prayer is not some mechanical process and what we just do it and so we can check it off our list every day because we're just a good Christian. That prayer is about a relationship. It's about recognizing that we desperately need to be in God's presence. It's about the understanding that we need to be in the presence of the one that we love and the one that loves us more than we can possibly understand. Prayer is not about you getting what you want. It's about a relationship with the eternal king. Prayer is relationship. And that's exactly what our text is about today. In Exodus chapter 33, we're gonna see that Moses cries out in desperation to God because he understands that he needs his presence. So today I wanna show you three truths about this text, three truths that come out. That number one, that we have a need that we can't overlook. Number two, we have a privilege that we should never neglect. And number three, we have a mission that we cannot complete. A need that we can't overlook, a privilege we cannot neglect, and a mission that we cannot complete. And then I wanna talk about how this applies to each of us today. And understand this morning, if you're a Christian, out of your desperation for God's presence in your life, you will pursue him in prayer every moment of every day. That's what you should understand. That out of your desperation for God's presence in your life, you should, you should desire, you should pursue God in prayer with every moment, with every hour of every day. And today, if you're not a Christian, I encourage you to listen in. To hear the fact that God has made a way for you to be rescued from your separation from him. And that way is through faith in Jesus Christ. And once again today, he is inviting you to come to him through faith in Christ. As we begin this morning, let me give you just a little bit of context, a little bit of background for our passage so we kind of can see how it's flowing and what's going on. The, the book of Exodus is part really of a five-part, five-group book, one unit. Uh, it's grouped with Genesis and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. And this five-part group is often called the Pentateuch or the Torah. It's always been seen as one. 